to such a large number. Uh, this here on stage is Brian. Brian is a developer advocate in Snake Company, if I pronounce that right. And today he's going to talk about uh, how you can hack into someone's web app, uh, Node.js and Java web app. So enjoy. And please welcome Brian. Wow. I think people, some people made a mistake. Or you're at the wrong room. Or they book me in the wrong room. I mean, this is a security talk, right? So, you know, people find security boring. So if you want to learn about microservice, you have to go that way. Now, we're going to talk about security in this case and some practical points. Because first, I want to show you a word. The word DevSecOps. Who likes the word DevSecOps? Three, four out of 50. That's a whole lot. I hate the word DevSecOps. I mean, the meaning of DevSecOps is important, but the word DevSecOps is the worst thing ever. I mean, we had developer and operations, we put that together, and it sounded cool like DevOps. But security is so important, let's put it in the middle. And then we have DevSecOps. It feels like my grandfather who wants to talk slang to his grandchildren. And the grandchildren are like, no, Dad, that's not cool. But DevSecOps is important. And the importance of that security part in the middle is we need to do something with security. And we're, most of us are developers. Who is a developer over here? Practically everyone. Who's a manager? A manager and developer is then you're still a developer. That's good enough. No, but as a developer, you care about features, not so much on the security part of development. But first, before going into details, let, int let me, me introduce myself. I'm Brian, I work for a company called Sneak, and Sneak is a security company. Not so much only, we do, on one part we do research on security and look at vulnerabilities, but also we provide developer tooling. And with that developer tooling, we enable you as a developer to easily scan your stuff and to make sure that you are secure. That's enough about the company. I do a lot of work in the community for the Utrecht Jug, Utrecht Java User Group, the Secure Developer, which is a virtual group focusing on secure development, duh. And the Virtual Jug, which is the first and only virtual Java user group around the world. And we try to manage that from three parts in the world. We have a lot of talks from famous Java speakers on well, a variety of topics. But let's go back to that, that, that DevSecOps thing, because we want to solve something, right? But before we want to solve something, there needs to be a problem, because, or else it doesn't need to be solved. So what's the problem? Well, say, for instance, five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I worked at a government agency, and we basically deployed our stuff three times a year, because it needs to be safe. And we had pen testers, and they need to get all over that, and we need to be sure that everything that's there works properly. But nowadays, in most companies, it can be the fact that we actually deploy three times a day. So that means we're speeding up that development cycle, because our companies need to be better than the competition. We need to be bigger, better, stronger than the competition to make more money, basically. And if our competition, if the, if the competitor has it out sooner, then we probably have, well, less profit or a problem even. But that's the point that we speed up that, that development life cycle also ends in the fact that we do not care that much about security because I have this product owner and he tells me, I want this new feature yesterday. Well, that's impossible. Today, okay. So what I do is I make a most I make, I make a least valuable product, a most valuable product, and I bundle it and I push it into production. So I may look at a little well. It's not the cleanest code, but it's certainly not the most secure code. But it works and it's fine because my manager is already there screaming, "I want more! I want more! I want more!" And what we see is we do DevOps. Who does DevOps? Well, let me rephrase that. Who creates programs 
And when something bad happens, they call you to fix it while it's in production. Uh, don't hesitate. If you need to maintain it and you need to put it into production and you need have credentials to go into production, you're doing DevOps. Maybe a different flavor. But the point is, we try to get operations into our team. But what about security? Security is still siloed at the end. There is this bad security department that only is there to say no. Can I go to production? No. But I, no. I hate these guys. Right? Because I spend all my time and energy to put something on the table that is good, and then they say no. And the point is, saying no at the end cost the company, or cost me, a lot of time and money. If I can do that on the starting point of development, we might catch things earlier, and the people at the end will not say no. Well, the chance will be slimmer, right? And at the end, there's one thing we need to, be to, we, we need to take care of. That is customer data. I mean, I work for a government agency, for banking institutions, for e-commerce platforms. The last thing we want is that customer valuable data gets out in the open. But that's all fun and stuff, and it's important. But how bad is this situation? Well, question to you. Who has ever heard of the company called Equifax? A few of you. Who, have, who had heard of Equifax, say, two years ago? One. I would say that's good marketing. Equifax was a crediting company in the US, and they used an outdated Apache Struts library. And because they didn't upgrade that library, well, somebody found out there was a vulnerability in that library, and people could sneak in. Equifax didn't know. In the end, long story short, 143 million records were exposed. You can say that is marketing, because now half the world knows your name. But I think they backed the difference. And the fun part is, for Equifax, once the uh, vulnerability was disclosed, they didn't notice. So there was already a solution available. And people were in that system for months, just snooping around, seeing what they could get, and at the end they just released 143 million records. So let's put that back to our systems. Say you're writing a software system, like this, a nice big system. What part is your code? Probably this. Because the rest we depend heavily on frameworks, on libraries, on more libraries that depends on other libraries, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. So if I take this node application, it's a small serverless example, and it, it has 19 lines of code. Sounds great. Sounds like good programming. If I look at my dependencies, I have two direct dependencies. Well, one is AWS SDK. How many dependencies will I pull into my system? Any guess? It's Node, but it's not that bad. It's not 200. They say Node downloads the internet, kinda, but it's only 19, which is a fair amount. But still, we do not know what these dependencies are, because I just adopt them and I can do my stuff. I focus on the business logic, which is cool. How many lines? 19 dependencies, I said. How many lines of code do you think my 19-line serverless example will be in total? Like the amount of lines of code that I will put into production. Sorry? With all, so the actual package I just push into, in this case, a serverless environment, AWS. 3,000, somebody says. Well, it's more like 200,000. And do you know which code is used? How many of you trust your coworker? Like blindly? Okay, who does code reviews? Say we don't trust you, but let's make it better. Who does code reviews? A lot. The rest of you doesn't, but probably does, does pair programming good enough. But we do take dependencies in as a black box. It works, ship it. Right? D did you ever look at what these things do? Of course not. 
I don't have the time for that. I'm not getting paid for that. So another one. This one is a Java example, Spring Java example. It is a very horrible program because I wrote it. 222 lines of code, a lot of duplication in there. We had five direct dependencies, which results in over 50 dependencies. How many lines of code will be there in production? Just name a number. A million? Somebody? Uh, it's, it's not Node. It's Java. Sorry. Sorry, I'm a Java programmer. I'm a, sometimes I make fun. But it's still, it's almost half a million lines of code. And Spring does a lot of magic under the hood. So people can say, but we don't use that. Are you sure? Who's a Java programmer over here? Or did some Java? You probably know there's something like the Reflection API. Nasty stuff. Nasty stuff. It's good because it works, but it's nasty stuff. You do not know which part is, there's an instance of, or of that or not. And I mean, if you, if you spin up Spring Boot, and for instance, you have the MongoDB driver in it, just the driver, it automatically tries to connect to a MongoDB instance. I didn't do that. Magic. So we depend on code. We depend on frameworks. We depend on open source, which is good. Don't get me wrong. But open source is not particularly insecure, but it's also not particularly secure. I mean, it's in between. It's just like you're, you, you and me. We write code, and maybe we actually contribute to open source uh, packages. But there are mistakes in there sometimes. And can you imagine that if there is a mistake in a package that will be used heavily, what will the attacker do? He or she will attack that open source package. Basically, what happened to Equifax? They were not targeted. They were just in the crossfires. People were just using that hack and try to get it to you, to you, to you, to you, and then Equifax was in the middle. It worked. Hey, let's continue. And that's how it works. If we look at the ecosystems, the amount of packages grew massively over the last year. And NPM is the clear winner. You could say something about the quality of packages, but I know that there are some node programmers over here. I do not want to step on anybody's toes. But if we look at Maven, Maven Central, which is still the main repository for Java, there is still an increase of 100,000 packages in a year. And if we look at the vulnerabilities that will be disclosed every year, we see that Maven is the clear winner, unfortunately. And if we look at these packages, and let's zoom into Maven and NPM in this case, it's not the direct dependency. Because your dependency is depending on something else and on something else, and deep down below there is some Jackson data binding package that has a deserialization problem. Did you know? I didn't. And if we ask these open source maintainers how confident they are on their own security knowledge, 63% says kinda and we do not even trust our own neighbor our own co-worker we check their code but we do trust blindly on these fellows and this one is funny who was responsible for security 81 percent of our respondents said developers and it's a shared responsibility of course but we need to do something well we had more stats like how did you find out 27% probably don't. And the fun part is once a, once, once a vulnerability is discovered, it takes over 16 days to get it, on average, to get it fixed, which is a good thing. People are there to fix it. Open source maintainers want to be on top of these problems. But who has a legacy application yet in production that you need to maintain? Who still has this big monolithic thing that's there for years, don't touch it because it will break? If we have a vulnerability, how many days on average, well, let's keep it, how many years on average will it take to disclose someone, something? Two and a half years. So if your program was top notch, you put it into production, you didn't change any of the dependencies, you probably have a, have a mistake there. And who uses Docker? Who builds their Docker image on top of, say, the Node image or the, the MongoDB image or, say, an, a base image that's already there and available on Docker Hub? Yeah, some of you, right? We tested the, 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 the 10 most downloaded packages, and the Node package, package by default had over 500 vulnerabilities. 
Most of them were operating system vulnerabilities. But still, we blindly trust on it. So we can do more stats and more stats and more stats, but let's go to the hacking part because I promise you that we do some live hacking. So for that, I need to change my screen. And you probably, yes, you see what I want you to see. And I will show you, let me go there. Yes. So I will have a, I will have an application. This one is a node application. And it's a to-do app because I need to do things. Like I can say something like buy flowers, right? Because I'm a, a long way from home and my wife still wants me, hopefully. So I need to buy her flowers sometimes. And this app also has something awesome, which is an about page. Right? You see, I'm a great designer. But I know that this application uses a vulnerable ST package. So, and that ST package, by my knowledge, can do path traversal. So let's do that path traversal life. So how do I do path traversal? Does anybody have any idea on that? By changing the URL. Yeah. By changing, well, something with you. First of all, there is, a, normally I would put my hoodie on and would put my hood on, but yeah, it's a bit warm here. First of all, I don't go to the browser. I go to the terminal because what kind of a hacker would I be if I do it in the browser, right? So let's do it. First, I use curl. What is it? Localhost 3001 slash public slash about. Don't misspell it. Cool, that works. So we want to do path traversal over it. Something, somebody called something on the URL. Well, basic thing, path traversal will be something like this, right? Dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash. Let's try it. Okay, give me something back, which is plain HTML, which is unfortunately the homepage of my goof to do. Because the ST package is a real package, and it checks for path reversal, but it does check only on the two dots. So it blacklists instead of whitelisting. By knowing this, what should I do? Any ideas? How about escaping? Sounds fair, right? Let's do something like uh, this. Nah, it doesn't work. All right, any ideas? No hacker in the room? Really? How about URL encoding? Who knows the URL encoding for a dot? I'm glad because last time I, I said this and it was URL encoding and somebody put his hand up. Percent to E and I was like, okay, this is scary. Are you a programmer or are you actually a hacker? I don't wanna know. So let's clean this one up and say, for instance, what, uh, what did I say, percent to E and let's uh, do that again just by copy pasting this part. And let's do it all over, all over, all over again. Why? Because when I'm in the root and I do dot, dot, slash in the root, I end up in the root. And ta-da, I'm in the root. And of course, this is bound to the user and, where, uh, the, and how many privileges the user has. But just think about things like OS vulnerabilities as well. Because what I can do now, for instance, is and nobody in his right mind would, uh, would put any passwords in his past WD file, but I can look into that. And there are still many people who put their configuration as in test right away to production and, ah, sorry, it was running as a root, unfortunately. So you see by this simple hack, I can have, have read, uh, read access to my application. And this is not much. I mean, okay, you cannot change anything. So what? But this is the starting point. Because what I can do, for instance, 
if I just take all this percent two E away, you can do that faster. Yes, I know. But this is fun. It's calming. And do it like this. I will see I'm over here. And let's go into the package.json. And now I, have, now I know all your dependencies. And I can simply look for new vulnerabilities. So this is my starting point. Read access is the first, point, first trouble. I can read and I can do research. Because it's never it's just one problem you have. It basically are two, three, four, or five problems. And it's not one problem that you put in production, but over time, these problems will be established. So now I know what my thing is. And let's see what's over there. There's an MS package in it. And I know that the MS package has a, has a vulnerability as well. Let's go into that one. So I go back to my application. And um, first question for you all. Who likes regular expressions? Two, three, four. Who likes reading other people's regular expressions? <laughs> Who likes debugging your coworkers' regular expressions? Nobody, right? Like a regular expression is more of a one-time thing, write only. But if I have a regular, regular expression like this, say a very silly one. This is the regular expression I have, and I want to match it to this string that perfectly matches. But how do you know how it matches? Does it use the plus? Does it use the star? Does it use the star until halfway and then the plus? I don't know. That depends on the implementation of that engine, right? But what we do know on regular expressions is if it doesn't match instantly, then it goes into backtracking mode. And basically, we will try every string that matches that regular expression onto the string you feed it. Right? So what about if I give you a very, very long regular expression on how many threads does a Node.js application work? One. So if I gave it a very long regular expression that goes into backtracking mode, what happens? We have basically a denial of service. We call this a regular expression denial of service, a redos. So let me show you. Let me first show you a normal call. I will use HTTP on it. That means I'm able to fill in forms from the command line. So by putting up this, I say, call mom in 20 minutes, and I put it to this form. By doing this, you will see I get a, I, I get a, a response back. And if I look into, you see, it does something with a 20 and a minutes, and it's pushed it back to 20 M. Cool. So let's put in this one. So what I do over here is I create a line of 60,000 fives and match it to minutes and see what happens. It comes back instantly. Why? Because it matches. And if you see here what it matches to, buy milk in infinity days. By then, it's probably sour, but fair enough. So what should I do by making sure that we go into that real backtracking mode? Just make sure it doesn't match. So I already told you I'm Dutch. And I misspell everything. So fortunately, I can do this. Right? Instead of minutes, I do minutes because it sounds cool. And you see it hangs. And if I do something like, you see it hangs. And that's very very convenient, for instance, see, and now the thread is done with all the possible strings that match that regular expression, and then it gives back computing power to the browser. So say I am the competitor of Amazon. I worked for a company called Bold.com, and we were, the, in Holland, the main competitor of the Amazon likes 
companies. If I do this on Black Friday to Amazon and they are not available, people will come to me, which is fun. But imagine this, who is working in the cloud? Well, basically, normally if you work in the cloud, you probably have this elastic scaling kind of thing. So if an instance is overloaded, someone poops up, pops up, pops up, pops up. If I do this, then it's not a denial of service, it's denial of pocket money because your bill will be sky high. Because I simply force you to instance more and more and more and more and eventually I will get you bankrupt. So this one is a very important one. And just by inserting a, re a regular expression, that, hello? Yeah. that doesn't resolve quickly enough. If I put another zero to that 60,000 and make it 600,000, we will be sitting here all day. And it's quite narrow, so don't do that. Next one, I will go into a Java application. Hopefully it's still started up. No, of course it doesn't because it's in, on Heroku and if I am there for more than uh, 50 minutes or well, if I'm away for more than 50 minutes, it will shut down. So it needs to spin up. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the famous Apache struts hack from Equifax. So once this one is up and it's up now, I can uh, sign up and I will sign up at uh, Brian, of course. My password will be 126 because I work for a security company and that's very valid. 123456, perfect. So no, don't, don't, don't save that. And again, it's a to-do list because we like to do things. And I can, I, can, I can create a to-do list like, again, buy flowers for my wife. Well, let's put it on uh, the 1st of the February 1970. Let's give it a high priority by then. It's very necessary. So that's all cool. I can do this. And um, we have an about page, and nobody does this, but here you'll see that we use an Apache Struts library that's vulnerable 2.3. You can look it up. So with that Apache Struts vulnerability, let's show you that. I will go back to the terminal, and I will hack this one. So. The Apache Struts vulnerability, let me just show you the header that I need to insert, because that one is not so obvious. Say, let me redo that, and let me enlarge that. What I do over here is I insert a content type. Who recognizes this content type? Nobody, because it's completely bogus. It's wrong. It's not a valid content type. But what I do here is I enable the D DSL from Apache Struts, the OGNL language, object graph navigation language. And what I do over here with an object graph na navigation language, with OGNL, I'm able to get and set stuff from objects that are there, but also make instances of new objects. And unfortunately, well, fortunately for, my, for me, for this demo, if I put in a content type that's not valid, it goes into an exception flow. And in that exception flow, in this version of Apache Struts, I can enable OGNL. And that's what I do here. So because it's in an, in an exception flow, I enable OGNL, and what I do is I simply call the bash with a command. And this command is just a substitute. So I will do something with it. Just by using this header, and you do not have to find out about this because somebody already did and just put it on the internet. And it's free to use, so try it. No, don't. Sorry, wrong advice. So for instance, um, I have here the... Let's go to the... Uh, Exploits. What? Oh, I mistyped. Oh, I already told you I'm Dutch, right? So, say I have this one. I will just want to have the environment variables, and not from my local machine. But no, let's 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 get rid of this one, and let's go to that uh, to the one on the internet. So let's put put up this one, right? By doing this, using this, the, the header I just showed you, substitute that command string for 
env, which basically gives me the environment variables, and put it, this into a real instance that is there in the cloud that you can try it. And you will see I will have the environment variables of my Heroku instance. That's scary. Because I can execute any argument, any command that's there on Linux. So I can basically also overwrite other things. So say, hypothetically, I will overwrite the LS today. And in two days, I will come back, and I will do LS, which does something completely different. Good luck finding out in your logs what happened. Right? And you see over here, this one is real, because the fun part is, I know where the Java home is in my Heroku instance. Now let's use that for the next hack, because this application has another problem. We can upload files. And we can upload zip files. And what I'll do is I will do a zip slip vulnerability. Let me show you one thing first. I created to do, and I will do something like this. And I will use the pi character. If I create this, you will see that it comes back as an ASCII representation. Because I know that every title goes to the native to ASCII function that is there in the JDK. OK, what if I can overwrite that one with something arbitrary? But how should I do that? We have, um, you see that here I've got a zip file prepared. Let's go into that zip file. This zip file has two things, a good dot text and a second file that has dot dot slash, dot dot slash, dot dot slash, dot dot slash, slash app dot JDK bin native to X ASCII, which is exactly the path of my JDK that's in my Heroku instance. So now I'm able, if, if this works, I'm able to unzip it and to put an arbitrary file outside of the sandbox I'm working in. And this native to ASCII file just echoes something like muhaha, got you. So by doing this, and I'm using a library called uh, ZT Unzip for this, I will upload this file. I have a lot of crap on my computer. Where is my, yes, demo. Let's, mm -mm -mm. there it is. Java to do exploits. Over here, I've got this zip slip thing. Let's open that one and let's upload it. And you'll see that in the public folder where I expect my stuff to be unzipped, I only see the good dot text. That can mean two things. Or it ignored that whole dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash thing, or it ex actually executed that one. Well, let's see. I'll do something, I don't care. And you will see that I overwrite a native function in the JDK. Because that library specifically had a problem that it doesn't look at the input. It just takes the path, it takes the file name, it puts them together and it executes. So it doesn't look if there is a dot dot slash dot dot slash if it tries to break out of the boundary. Fortunately, the guys from ZT did fix this instantly when we found this one. But if you didn't know, then you have this one in your system. And it's just upgrading from 1.12 to 1.13. So, point I want to take here is, going back to the slides, is that we have to do something about this. Because we're using stuff from other people. And that can be dangerous. And we probably don't know because this is not part of my unit test suite. Yours? But what is the solution? Well, the solution is not only tooling, unfortunately. Because if that was the case, I would be rich. Now, the problem is three phases. First of all, team culture. And I think that is the most important one. Process and tooling. And what do I mean by team culture? 
Well, we have different people in our teams. We have dev developers, and developers care about new stuff, cool stuff. We want to ship this stuff as soon as possible, and we only want to take care of business logic. But we want to ship, right? We, want to, we, are, we are creators. Security people don't care about that. They just care about the fact that they will not get breached, which is a fair point, because that's their main objective. So if you will not go to production, security people can just sleep, and they don't care. Because if it's not going to production, it will not be vulnerable. Operations, what do they, they, they care about? They care about that if we have traditional operations, the, the people care about, can, I, can it be scalable? Can I maintain it? If it crashes, can I just put it on and off and does it work again? Right? And if it's not there, we do not have to maintain it. And what do, well, we had a few managers in the room. What do managers care about? And I mean high-level managers, so C-level managers. Exactly, they care about the money. Because most of the, the companies we work for need to make profit, right? They need to pay me and you. So they want to get these, this stuff out as soon as possible because they want to be ahead of their competitors. But take care. Just take the first two, the developer and the security guy. Or girl, sorry. If we just get together a little bit more, so if we can take that security uh, focus on in our development cycle, we probably make sure that we do not get into a fight with security people, and we, in the end, we probably will be shipping faster and safer. So we need to get that cultural thing switched around. Then talking about process, because by doing this, we could say, okay, we buy this new tool suite and let's do it. It's about the thing like, who wants to change? And everybody raises their hand. Oh, who wants to change? Everybody raised their hand. And that is, who wants to change? Nobody. Because that's the truth. We do not want to change. Nobody wants. Because it's quite comfortable where we are. So if we can make it a little change, say the process that you already have, if we can incorporate things like automated testing uh, or non-intrusive testing and make it as easy as possible, then you probably do it. Because if you, do, if you need to do a, a ton of work next to just creating your new software, you will do it for one day, two days, three weeks, and then gradually you will go back to your old habits. True or not? I will. So we need to make that process change non-intrusive. And then, of course, the tooling. You need to have all sorts of tooling in place. Not only the tooling I'm, my company provides, but also things like static analysis checking. Because al although your part of the code is just this, if you compare it to the whole program, you still need to check it. But if you have this tooling available, you can make sure that it's automated. And when it's automated, you do not have to do anything anymore. It will ping you automatically when something is wrong. It may be a false positive, but instead of you checking actively, it's a good thing to automate these things and let it ping you. So how should you do that? Well, it's not only people think it's from your CI point of view, for, from your pipeline point of view, but let's make that pipeline even bigger. So may, let's call about the development cycle. You code from your IDE, then you put it into your GitHub or your Git repository. Then it goes into your CI pipeline, and then it goes into production. Make sure that in every stage, you do these checkings, and you have the right tooling available. For instance, in your IDE, it would be nice if I can check my dependencies when I introduce them, right? If I introduce them and my feature branch is there out for, for a week or something because I'm developing it, and at the end, I push it to the master branch, and in my CI pipeline, I will get this page. It might break changes, or it might break API if I need to upgrade it to another version. So if I can introduce these tests from my IDE or from my local machine, wouldn't that be great? So for instance, if we have things like plugins over here, if I have a plugin over here and I scan a particular, uh, a particular project and I see, okay, we have a problem over here, which is the ZT, the zip vulnerability I just showed you. 
Now I know that this one is from 112 and I need to upgrade it to 113. Cool. I can do it right away before it hits my master branch. But we still need to do the other parts. I mean, the master branch or your Git repo, every time somebody is pushing there, you want to scan it. And even if you do not touch it, I mean, what can be safe now might be vulnerable tomorrow. So why not scan it on a, day, on a daily basis and integrate this into some sort of dashboard or something? So by doing that, and I will have an overview of all my things, in this case, I just binded, uh, binded Git up here to see if there's a vulnerability. And again, there are many tools, and I'm showing my tool, of course, because I use, I, I'm using it, but you can use, well, a dozen tools that can do these kind of things to see where is the vulnerability that is, that is there. All, everything I show you, by the way, is can, you can use for free, so no worries, you can try it out. So by doing this, every time something comes into my repo, it will be tested. But also, if somebody puts in a new pull request, I want to see the delta, and if that pull request breaks something. By doing all these things, from development on your local machine, even by, we also have a CLI, we, 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 uh, which can do that. But if you check from your development cycle and your repo, and you do it in your CI pipeline, and your CI pipeline, you still need to have that gatekeeper at the end. Because in the meantime, something can happen. You're not done yet, because then it's in production. And what then? Why not take a snapshot of what's there and try to scan it on a daily basis? And you will get actively alerted if something goes wrong. Then you can fix it, and then you can actually prioritize it and call it to your manager like we have a problem, instead of throwing money at security and nobody knows where it goes. So what we try to do here is we try to shift security left not only leave it up to the guys and girls at the end, the security team, but incorporate it in your whole process, from left, your development on your own computer, to right, the part in production. Oh, wow, I have to do it the other way around. Left to right, because I'm standing in front of you. So that means that if we have these tools available, and this one is a, is a dependency scanner, but also static analysis, uh, but also clean code things, and of course, we need to do code reviews because we can do stupid things. If we do that from left to right, it will save us time, money, but also a lot of headaches because nobody wants to do the same thing twice. If you want to know more about security in general for Java or NPM, we created a few cheat sheets which are more based on the code level of security. So how can I create secure code myself? So that part, we have a few cheat sheets out that may help you. If you want to take a picture of it, you can do it now. And I think we have a few minutes um, left for questions. So oh, I see people still make pictures. That's good. Yes, I'll put it up. Uh, if you want to know more about security in general, I would say take a look at The Secure Developer, which is an online vendor neutral community uh, which I co-lead. Um, and we have a lot of people there on that will give their views on how we can adopt security more into our development life cycle. My name is Brian. I work for Sneak. If you have questions, please come up now or find me on Twitter or find me here walking around and just bump on me and say, hey, I have a question or your programming sucks. You can say that. I probably ignore you, but no. But if you have a question, please feel free. Are there any questions right now? Where did you bought the shirt? Where did I bought what? The shirt. The shirt? Which no, which shirt? On the, on the, on the oh, the monitor, the screen. I don't know. My wife bought it for me. <laughs> Leave things to people who know what they do, right? <laughs> because I have no taste. That's why I wear navy blue. So I leave things up to the people who are there, well, who, who, know what the, who knows what they're doing. And in this case, my wife bought me that shirt, and I loved it. Any other questions? Where did you bought the hat?
No. <laughs> then I want to, oh, another question. Yes, please. So the question is, how do we usually learn about new stuff? Um, different ways. First of all, people in the open source community, if they find something, they will, in most cases, report it to us. We have a few security teams, both in Tel Aviv and in London available, that do actual research on it. Um, and we, therefore, we um, contribute to the CVE database. The CVE database is the common vulnerability, uh, well, common vulnerability database, common vulnerability and exploit database. And we contribute to that as well. We are a number authority now, so we give back to that community. But the point is, the open CVE database is just the tiny bit of what's vulnerable. There is a lot more, and that's why companies like my company will come in. So we do a lot of research ourselves by actually scraping GitHub repos and see if there are problems. Of course, we automate that, and if there's a problem, our security engineers go deep diving in if that's a real problem or not. For instance, who's an NPM developer? Or a, a Node developer? You have, you have heard of the Lodash problem like lately two, three weeks ago, or four weeks ago? We found that one, and we actually helped the maintainer to um, fix that. So the point is, if we find something, we also do not just put it in the open, it's vulnerable. We try to communicate with these open source maintainers to say, okay, let us help you, or maybe you can disclose it yourself, maybe you can fix it yourself, it doesn't matter, but let's make sure there is a fix available before we put it out in the open. Because if we put it out in the open, nobody, everybody is vulnerable. And from our point of view, if we can provide you not only with the fact that it's vulnerable, but also what is the fix, that will be helpful for a programmer, not only screaming, you're wrong. Yeah, okay, but how do I fix it, right? So that's basically the process we do. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any more questions? Well, then I think it's time for lunch, right? Uh, I'm hungry, yeah, though. Just, Thank you. Just another session, yeah.